John chapter number two this morning. John chapter number two. We began this chapter last week and we saw Jesus at the marriage and Jesus turning water into wine and this uh, idea of Jesus filling the table and bringing joy and, and all these sorts of things. And now we're gonna see a different story that is immediately on the hills of this, but is far different. It's such a contrast to the first story that we saw. So John chapter number two, verse 13 is where we'll pick it up. If you do not have a Bible, the verses in our text are actually in the bulletin on a little outline. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, once again, go to the guest center. Uh, we would love to give you one. We have plenty of them. It'd be our gift to you. Uh, we would love to send you home with a copy of God's word if you don't have one and just to be a blessing to you. John chapter number two, look at verse number 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So geographically, Jesus is in Galilee going to Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is actually south, but topographically, it's up. It would be like if you said, I'm going to go up Mount Washington. Now, Mount Washington is south of here, but it's actually up, right? So this is what Jesus is doing, climbing up to Jerusalem. And it says in verse 14, he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves. These are the sacrificial animals that will be sacrificed at the temple and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overthrew the tables. Now, if you thought Indiana Jones was original with his whip, think again. Uh, this seriously is, is not what most people imagine in terms of, you know, dark-eyed Jesus breathing fire with an Indiana Jones-style whip lacerating people. Uh, this, this is intense. There's no doubt about that. There is righteous indignation here, and we'll walk through that as we consider this text. Uh, but the whip especially is something I want to make note of. Uh, the, the word that's used for this is only used twice in the Bible. It's actually a word that means from the rushes or from the reeds. So this is plant-based. Uh, the Bible goes out of its way to say that it's small cords, to say that these are kind of small weeds. Uh, the, the best picture I could give you of this, if you wanted to accurately picture this in your mind's eye, is if you've ever had maybe a wicker broom that was a small broom with a little stubby handle that you would use to kind of sweep off the table or the shop bench or something like that. You may have seen those for sale at some sort of market. Uh, that would be the closest thing that I could give to what this whip really is. It's kind of a makeshift, put some uh, little weeds together and, and hold it in my hand. And uh, this, is, this is actually a wimpy whip, if truth be told. Okay, this is something that is not going to hurt you. You wouldn't want to be hit by it, but it's not going to hurt you. It's kind of like a Nerf gun. You know, if I point a Nerf gun at you, you're going to say, don't shoot me. But if I do shoot you, you're not going to get hurt by it. So uh, have an accurate picture of that. Jesus is not like lacerating people's faces here and being ultra violent, but it is very intense. Uh, verse number 16, he said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence or get these things out of here. Make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And the disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. That's a quote from Psalm 69. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus, uh, what gives you the authority to do these things? Give us a sign. Give us an indication of this. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, uh, 40 and six years was this temple and building. Wilt thou rear it up in three days? And Jesus, I know you're a carpenter, but we've been building the temple here for 46 years, and they still have about 30 years to go. There were 18,000 men building for 70 years-ish. Jesus, you're going to build it up in, in three days? Verse number 21, but he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. I must admit that I, for a long time, found it very curious that John puts these two stories next to each other as the intro into Jesus and Jesus' ministry. Uh, John makes it clear at the end of his book that he does not have a lack of stories and opportunities to tell us about Jesus. He says at the end of his gospel that if the stories of Jesus and the miracles he did and what he taught, if, if the book should be written, the world could not contain the volumes and the books that should be written about Jesus. 
So John, isn't, he doesn't have a word count that he's trying to fill, that he's just searching for a story. I can't remember anything, so I'll just put this one in here. This, this is, is purposely here, and back to back with the story of Jesus at the wedding, and now you find Jesus in the temple. And on the surface, they look starkly different. And honestly, they are different in so many ways. You find Jesus in one story filling the table, and then you find Jesus in the other story overthrowing the table. And one, you find Jesus kind of in the shadows and not stepping forth and taking credit. And the other, you find Jesus out in the open. And one, you find Jesus reflective and somber. And the other one, you find Jesus loud and in your face. And one, you find that Jesus brings joy and celebration. And the other, Jesus brings upheaval and commotion. And it almost seems like Dr. Savior and Mr. Messiah here, that they're two different people, but they're not. They're one and the same. It's Jesus. And I would argue that you have to have and know the Jesus in both of these stories. And if you don't, then your Christian life will be dashed into pieces. What is happening here in this story? Well, Passover is happening. What's Passover? Passover is the biggest hubbub, the biggest celebration, the biggest holiday that the Jewish people would celebrate, and especially centered around Jerusalem. This is the big festival in the big city. Think kind of Big Apple with the ball dropping, you know, in Times Square during New Year sort of thing. Like there's a lot of people that are being drawn into the city that are there when they otherwise would not be there. And Jesus gets to the temple and he finds animals for sale, for sacrifice, and he finds money changers. Now, what is, what is happening here? The animals that were, were for sale were those that were used in the sacrifices, the sheep, the oxen, <coughs> and the doves, excuse me, <coughs> And you find that these animals have typically been for sale around Jerusalem. It was a matter of convenience for many years that people would travel a long way. Let's say I'm traveling 50 miles by mule to Jerusalem to go there and to worship at Passover, to pay my temple tax, to do this on an annual basis. And you don't want to drag your sheep or take your doves with you. Just leave them at home or don't have them at all. And when you get there, you can buy them. Maybe you were a farmer and you had grain. So just take your money, bring them there. You can buy them there. This had happened across the Kidron Valley, away from the temple for many years. But history tells us that in recent years, it had moved into the temple proper and they were selling them there. Now, Jesus comes in and he finds this and he is upset about this. So what's, what are they doing? They're selling these to people, but part of what happened was just the fact they're selling. Part of it was the markup. You would find in Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel that Jesus does the same thing again years later at the end of his ministry. And he t tells them that they have a den of thieves. What had happened was there was a supply and demand issue. We have a lot of demand. We have a supply that's enough, but now we can mark up the price. Now we can charge people an arm and a leg and we can have a cash cow so that we can make money off of this. So if you've ever been to Disneyland and bought a churro for $87, you know what's happening, right? This is what's happening. We have something you need. You're gonna have to buy it. We can mark up the price. And this is a great business venture. We're making money off of this. We're, we're, we're lining our pockets with this. And Jesus is upset about this. There's money changers that are here. And what had happened was the temple and those in leadership of the temple decided we're only going to take one currency so that you can pay your temple tax. Adult males had to pay an annual temple tax. And they said, you know what? You have other currency and other money that's, that works everywhere else. But in the temple, on these grounds, we're only going to take one currency, and we will make you exchange that for our currency. And when you're exchanging currency, who always gets the better rate, and who is it in favor of? The one who's in control, right? If you've gone to another country and you've exchanged at an airport or something, you know there's always a fee. If you've been to Chuck E. Cheese, you get this. I have my money that works everywhere else, but I come into your facility and now you make me change my money for your little worthless tokens and now I can use this to pay for the games and that sort of stuff. This isn't exactly what's happening, but it's more or less. Like this is a Chuck E. Cheese, Dave and Buster sort of gamut that they're running to make sure that people are paying them and they're, and they're lining their pockets again. And this is greedy. This is a den of thieves that they're trying to make money off of people. So Jesus makes the wimpiest whip ever can concocted and decides to drive them out and tell them, get this out of here. My father's house will not be a house of merchandise. Get out of here. And the disciples say the verse that would encapsulate what is happening in this moment, they quote Psalm 69, 9. 
And they say, for the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me, on thee. They say what's happening here is what David the psalmist wrote about, that the zeal for the house of the God is, is eating up Jesus. Now, men and women are eaten up by a lot of things. Some by pride, some by lust, some by money, some by covetousness, some by greed. People are eaten up with a lot of things, but you find that Jesus is eaten up with zeal for God's house. The glory of God, jealousy of his name, love for the divine family is like a flame that is consuming the candle, burning and eating up and consuming at the same time that this is what is propelling and driving and motivating and funneling Jesus to be so intense in this moment. Now, it brings me to the first of two questions I have this morning, and that's a very simple one, but I think it's a profound question from this text, which is, do you, do I, have a desire for God? Is there zeal for the Father's house? Is there a zeal for His glory, a zeal for His name to be protected? Is there something that is consuming there? And I don't mean lukewarm desire. I do not mean half-hearted desire. I mean what this text is getting after, something that is deep, something that is powerful, something that is driving. We find that David leaves his sleep for meditation upon the Scriptures. We find that Anna is a widow and she gives herself night and day to prayers and fasting. We find that Paul says that his kind of stated philosophy was that, hey, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, I forget the things which are behind and I reach forth and I press toward the goal that I I take myself up and I funnel and bundle and push myself with all that I have towards a pursuit of Jesus that I may know him, that I'm being driven by this and consumed by this This is something that should be a part of the Christian walk. The Christian life is not supposed to be passive. It's not supposed to be just this lazy spiritual river that I just kind of float along on and go through the motions and just little by little, I I just kind of continue on. It's supposed to be something that that has decisive action, that's being funneled and fueled by, by the supreme desire for Jesus in relationship with him. I've met people that have said words like these. Hey, I'm a Christian, but you know, I just, I just don't get those born again kind. You know, those people that call themselves born again, they just, they seem like they're a little bit too zealous. They're always talking about Jesus. It's always Jesus something. They're just a little bit too overboard for my liking. What you're saying, if you say that, is that Jesus is part of my life. Jesus is an add-on. Jesus is just, he's just, he's just one of my hobbies, And this is a beautiful place where Christianity is explained that the Christian life is supposed to be radical. It's supposed to be intense. It's supposed to be that casualness is over, that indifference is over, that there's something that does motivate you. Christianity is a hobby. It's a weird hobby. Really, it's a weird hobby. It's not meant to be a hobby. I'm for you taking up hobbies. You want to pick up golf, fishing, hiking, taekwondo, renting your house on Airbnb, whatever. I don't care. But Christianity is not supposed to be a hobby. It's not an add-on. It's not a part of my life. It's not just, this is a piece of me. It's supposed to be something that says, you know, I'm seeking Jesus like a heat-seeking missile. I'm after him. I'm pursuing him. I'm, I'm being driven and motivated. And here Jesus is being driven, motivated, consumed by the Father's house, consumed by the Father's name. And the fact that people were reproaching the Father's house and reproaching the Father's name was something he took very personally, and he says, get that out of here. Now, I think it's a fair question to ask, how do I know, Pastor, how do I know if my desire for God is at a proper level? Okay, I have a desire for God. I, I mean, I'm here. I'm in church. What more do you want? I, I want to be here. I want to read my Bible. Like, I don't pray a lot, but I kind of want to pray. I mean, it sounds like a good idea in theory. I wish I had more time to do it. How do I know if my desire is where it should be? I'll give you three indicators from this text to know if your desire is improper or if it needs to grow some. Here's the first indicator. Your temple is filled with merchandise and not relationship. And I mean that metaphorically. But what was the temple? The temple was the place where the presence of God resided. This is why Jesus can say, I'm the temple in just a few verses, because the glory and presence of God were in that body. 
This is why the Bible calls you the temple of God now as New Testament believers, because the presence of God is in you and you are the temple. So is your temple filled with merchandise? It is very possible, especially in America, to live a life that is filled with things, filled with even good things, what some would even call essential things, that you crowd out relationship with Jesus and relationship with God. That I fill my schedule with, with family events and with work and with making some extra income on the side and even with some church events. And it could be that I come to church or I even serve, but you can so clutter your life with merchandise and with just the day-to-day -day that you end up crowding out the relationship. And that's a big part of what Jesus is after. This is why when he tells them two years from now when he's going to go back to the temple and he's going to do this again, he says, "My house, the Father's house should be a house of prayer. This is designed to be a place where people commune with God, where people have relationship. This is not supposed to be just about what's practical or what, what is helpful or what is some, somehow necessity that I need to buy and sell. It's not about merchandise. So what's your relationship with God like? Are you connecting with him? Well, it's been months, but I mean, I've been busy with some good things. I dare say Jesus would take his little whip, his little broom and say, get that out of here. Get it out. Declutter, eliminate, do whatever it takes to engage in relationship. This is not okay. You're designed to feel his presence, to have his love shed abroad in your heart, to walk with him and to commune with him. And we all struggle with that, even yours truly. I'm just as guilty as the rest of you of having my life filled with things and meetings and good things and church and prepping. And if I'm not careful, I can prep and study so much for sermons and content that I can neglect the relationship aspect and actually just stopping to commune with God and have intimacy with him. And Jesus is saying, throw it out, get it out. I want the relationship. So is your life so filled with merchandise that relationship is on the back burner? To sign that your desire is not what it should be. Secondly, your own interest and gains will be at the expense of those seeking God. And you have to understand some of the background here. Where is this happening? The tables, the money changers, the, the selling of the sacrificial animals. Where is this happening? You say, well, it's happening in the temple. Yes, but the temple's huge. Like the temple mound is massive. And there's a lot of different parts to the temple. We actually have a group of uh, 21 from our church that will be going to Israel tomorrow. They'll leave and they'll be there for 10 days. And some of you in this room will see the Temple Mount for the first time this week. And you'll, and you'll have this in your mind's eye and be able to picture it. But there's a lots of pieces to the temple. There's places where only the high priest can go. There's places where only the priest can go. There's places where only Jewish people can go. There's courtyards where only women can go. But where this was taking place was in the Gentile courtyard. What's the Gentile courtyard? It's, for, it's around back is what it is. It's technically on the side, but it's around back. It's the place where the sacrifices weren't actually happening. It's the place where the, the Jewish people who know God, they're not actually going through the system there. They're just, I'm buying this, I'm getting out of here. But for the Gentile people, this was supposed to be their place where they communed with God, where they, where they met him. So you would have people that are God-fearers, as the Bible calls them. What's a God-fearer? A God-fearer is a Gentile person who has not converted to Judaism, who has not been proselytized, who says, you know what, I'm not into the eat this, don't eat that, observe these days, don't observe these days, but I believe in your God. I believe in monotheism, that there's one God, and I believe in Jehovah God. I believe in Yahweh. I, I, I want to pursue him, and I want to worship him. Cornelius in Acts, the centurion, was a God-fearer. I'm a Gentile. I'm, I'm not Jewish, and I, I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm not welcome into the temple proper, but I still want to pursue God and have a relationship with him. There were also Gentile seekers, People that said, you know what? There's a lot that happens in the temple at Passover. I want to go check it out. I want to see, I mean, I'm used to pluralism and multiple gods and a pantheon of gods. And, and this is what I've been taught, but I hear there's something different. I want to go check it out. So the Gentile courtyard was a place where they would seek, where they would check it out, where they examine, where they were supposed to pray, where they were supposed to commune. And it's in this spot that they set up the shops. It's in this spot that the shady farmer's market is. Not, not, the Jewish people didn't put it where they're worshiping. No, they still have it carved out. They can pray. They can do their sacrifice. They're, they're all good. Nothing's interrupting. They're not praying with sheep bleeding in the background. 
They're not trying to talk to God and worship God while there's a bunch of commerce and, and hubbub happening behind them. No, but the Gentiles will put it there and we'll have this happen. And Jesus comes and says, this is not supposed to be the case. And this, honestly, still happens in many ways in churches today, where people put their own interests and their own gains ahead of the house of God and at the expense of other people seeking God. You say, what do you mean? How do we, how do, we do that today? There's a lot of ways. Welcome to church. Want to buy an absolution? Welcome to church. Want to buy holy oil that I prayed over that's extra special? This will really get rid of the devils. What is that? People making merchandise at the expense of those that are seeking God. And it's crooked and it's wrong. Probably won't happen inside a church a lot. It may happen on a TV channel late at night or something more often. But it happens nonetheless. Sometimes this happens in church this way. Hey, welcome to church. Good to meet you. Have ever heard that before? No, we haven't. Did I tell you uh, I'm having a pampered chef party at my house tomorrow? And then after, the night after that is Tupperware party. The night after that is essential oil party. The night after that is I'm going to meet people with the intention of leveraging them and leveraging my relationships at church to benefit myself and, and propel my pyramid scheme. And if you do any of those, I'm not against you doing those. I'm not against you having friends that you invite to your party. I'm not against that. I am against you having the mindset of let me go scout and let me go look for people and let me try to use this and that's your goal and that's your agenda. That's wrong. The goal and the agenda of the church is to come to church to edify each other, build each other up, pray with each other, pray for each other, not work in an angle so that you can make some money off of somebody. That's not what church is about. If I ever get to the place personally in my own life where I am pitching and peddling my Alaska cruise to make 10% off of you or a handkerchief that I sneezed on that now is extra special that you can buy for me or something like that, just please fire me. But that's not supposed to be the case. And all too often, people will put their own interests, their own greed, their own gains ahead of people seeking spirituality, seeking a relationship with Jesus, and they'll, they'll use it, and they'll circumvent the seeker's relationship. And Jesus knows what's happening here in the courtyard of the Gentiles. He says, I'm not okay with this, nor should he be okay with this. And he says, I want this gone. I want this out. Thirdly, I'd say this. Attacks on the Father will not be felt personally. Psalm 69 that the, that the disciples quote, the end of that verse says, the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. They are reproaching you, but I feel it. And I take it personally. And this is something they're doing against the Father. Jesus says, this is my Father's house. My Father's house will not be a house of merchandise. But because he's my Father and I'm his child, I feel this personally and I want to do something about it. If you, you get this, someone says something bad about your mother, your father, your spouse, your child, you bristle and you take that personally and you want to come to their defense, don't you? And sometimes it can be a bad thing when the teacher tells you, hey, they disobeyed. No, my kid would never obey. That can be taken too far. But naturally, because you love them, because you have desire for them, you want to have their back, right? And if I said something negative about your mother or your father and it didn't bother you, I would tell you that's an indication that your relationship with your mom or dad is not good. The fact that you don't care and the reproach to them doesn't fall upon you indicates your relationship is not where it should be. And the same thing is true of your relationship with God. Jesus says, this is a reproach to my father's house. I feel it personally. I'm going to do something about it. How does this apply to us? There are a million times throughout the, the course of this month where we will have people around us, maybe family, maybe coworkers, maybe neighbors, I don't know, but there are people that will essentially reproach the name of God and you should feel that. When Jesus' name is used not as praise but as a curse word, that should do something to you. When people want to damn the name of God, that should do something to you. And it may not even be someone in person. It may just be the television screen. When people are overtly against Jesus, that, that should mean something to you. You say, what does that mean? Should I, does that mean I should carry around this little broom in my back pocket and just whip people upside the head? They say something negative? No. 
You got to consider the whole, the whole scripture here, okay? The Bible tells us to walk in wisdom towards those who doubt and to have our speech be gracious and flavorful, tasteful, seasoned with salt. So this doesn't give you a hall pass to, to run around and be rabid and be crazy, but it does mean that you should speak the truth in love. It does mean that you should vocalize, that you should dialogue, that you should have conversations, that you shouldn't just let it go all the time and not care if people run down the name of God. Isn't this what, and when Jesus teaches us to pray in the model prayer, what does he lead with? Hallowed be thy name. That's a petition. Sanctify thy name. Make your name great. And there should be something in your heart that says, I want his name to be made great. I want his name to be lifted up. I want him to be magnified. And I take it personally when someone starts to tear it down. And if you don't and you don't feel that at all, it's an indicator that the pursuit and the relationship is off. It's off. Jesus felt it. He felt it. The text begs the question, do you have a desire for God? But I think in a deeper way, what this text really begs and what this really teaches us about Jesus is this question, do you have demands for God? Verse number 18. Let's reread this. I'll explain it in a moment. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus, you did this. What gives you the authority? Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and will thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So what happens here? Jesus overthrows their tables. And it's, it really is miraculous that he's able to do this. In, in the first century, Passover week was the week where there were more centurions, more guards, more, the Roman government was on red alert. If there was ever a time where, where the Jewish people would revolt and say, You're, we're no longer under your iron fist, this was the time. They're flooding into uh, Jerusalem. There's a lot of zeal and a lot of a religion happening. They loved to, if you study history, they would generally try to overthrow their oppressors by claiming the Temple Mount in Jerusalem first. So if there's a danger that something's going to go sideways for the Roman Empire, this is it. And they would station far more guards than normal. So if Jesus is, I mean, literally whipping people and just going completely berserks, the fact that he doesn't get arrested is amazing. But probably the opposite is true, where Jesus is, is aggressive and intense, but he has this flimsy whip and he's getting them out and the fact that he can get them all out with this is amazing there's lots of people guys animals and he's able to do it i don't know about you but if but if i'm sitting there and someone walks up to my money changing and just says hey psh, dumps it all out and flips my table generally speaking i'm going to be ticked about that right and there's a whole bunch of them that have commerce that do this so how how do we account for the fact that jesus is actually able to do this He's able to get them out. I cannot say exactly, but I believe that people instinctively knew he had a right to do this. That there was something about him and something about his authority that they knew he gets to do this. And that being the case, they come to him and say, we felt your authority and you did this. Give us a sign to know that we should really believe this. Give us a sign to know we should really lean into this authority. And Jesus gives them a genius response. Tear the temple down and in three days I'll build it up again. So on the literal and on the allegorical level, it's genius. On the literal level, they say, give us a sign. And you say, okay, do this, I'll do that. It'd be like this. It'd be like if you came to me and said, Pastor Mark, I feel that you have some sort of special power. I said, I do. I, absolutely. And you say, prove it. Okay. Cut your arm off. I'll put it back on. You're going to cut your arm off? I just met your demand, did I not? I told you, sure, I'll give you a sign. I'll do it. But you're not going to take me up on that. So on a literal level, this is genius because Jesus tells them, yeah, I'll give you a sign. And they're not going to take him up on it. Now, on the allegorical level, which is what this really is meant to be, this is Jesus saying, you know what? I'm talking about my body and I'm calling my shot. Eight ball corner pocket. I'm going to raise. This is going to happen one day. I'm telling you, this is going to be destroyed, but three days later, it's going to raise up again. And the disciples don't even get this in the moment. John says later, after he rose, they're like, we had been wondering for years what that meant. 
Now we finally get it. We get what he was talking about. But what is Jesus saying to them in this moment? They come to him and say, hey, give us a sign. What authority do you have to do this? What right do you have to do this? You act like you own this place. Jesus said, own it. I am it. I am the temple. This, this is what he's saying. And they're, they're a bit incredulous. They, they don't get it. They don't understand. Which is a theme all through John. Last week, mine hour has not yet come. What does that mean? This week, destroy it, I'll raise it up. Right over the heads. Next week, Nicodemus, you must be born again. I gotta crawl back in my mother's womb? How's that gonna happen, Jesus? After that, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. You want us to be cannibals? There's this constant, like, talking over their heads where they're not getting it spiritually. They're, they're not getting it. And this is, this is a case of that. And they, here's what's happened, okay? This is all building to this. If you get this, you'll get the text. What happens here is Jesus throws their tables over. And best they can tell, they never get an explanation. He comes in, he messes with everything, he does even give them a little bit of logic and wisdom, but they don't get it at all. They don't understand. And this is getting to the heart of what this is all about. They come saying, give us a sign. Tell us, tell us why. Give us a reason. Why should we let you do this? What makes you think you're the boss? And Jesus more or less says, I'm not domesticated. I'm not on a leash. I don't answer to you and your wisdom. I don't have to do what you say. I'm not tame. And here we learn one of the most vital lessons for all of your Christian life and all of your relationship with God, which is it is critical to obey God just because of who he is. It is Christianity 101 to obey God and to allow him control of your life just because of who he is. You say, I don't understand. I'm glad you asked. Let me see if I can illustrate. Let's suppose that you're in love with someone and you're engaged to be married in three weeks. And for sake of the illustration, you have large sums of money sitting in your bank account, stock market, you're rich, you're wealthy, millions. In three weeks from now, you're gonna be married and what do you know what? The stock market crashes and you lose everything. And you go to your spouse-to-be and you say, Hon, I'm, I hate to tell you this, but I've lost it all. I could use you and your help. I don't know how we're going to get past this, but we will eventually. We'll get past it. I've lost it all. And they say back to you, you know what? Maybe we should just cancel the wedding. You say, no, no, no. I've already prepaid. I've, I've bought the ring. I've paid for the venue. I got, I got the caterers. That's all squared away. We don't even need money for that. I already paid for it. You know, we're, we're all squared away. And they say, no, no I really think we, we should just hold off. We shouldn't get married. And you begin to understand that now that I'm poor, I'm not attractive. You would say, I'm outraged, I am deeply violated, rightfully so. This is a blow to my humanity that I've never felt before. You didn't love me for me, you loved me for what I brought to you. You loved my money. You loved what I gave. You didn't actually care about me, you're using me. You would be outraged, would you not? And rightfully so. And when Jesus comes into your life and he flips your tables over, the only reason he needs is he's God. And if you demand of him another reason, give me a sign. Tell me why. I have to understand. Help it make sense. Give me your rationale. Once you do that, then I'll let you do it. Then I'll be okay with it. Then I'll trust you. Then I'll allow you control. Then you can flip over my tables. You are doing to him what you would never allow someone to do to you. You're telling him, Jesus, meet my needs, provide for me, give me what I want, and then I'll let you do what you want. But until then, no, this is entirely circumstantial. I do not love you and trust you just for you. I love you and trust you for who you are. And if you would be outraged at that in your humanity, how much more right would he have to be outraged in his divinity? To say, you can't do this to me. Jesus in both of these stories is bringing us who he is, and both are abundantly true. He has the ability to fill your table, the beginning of John 2, and he has the right to overturn your table, the end of John 2, both. Those two go hand in hand. If you don't believe it, ask Job. Read the book of Job. 
God allows his tables to be overturned. And Job searches and scratches and claws and tries to figure it out and talks to his friends and is trying to make sense of it all. And he goes a long way, even whines about it some. And eventually you get to the end of Job where God comes to him and says, hey, Job, the lightning, does it consult with you where to strike like it does me? Hey, Job, the ocean, does it ask you where the borders are, where it should run up to and and come back like it does me? No, I didn't think so, buddy. Job, I get to do this for one reason and one reason alone. I'm God and you're not. And Job says, I see. I see. And he changes his paradigm and he changes his mind. God never gives him this big, long reason other than that. He never tells him that this is actually going to be good when it's all said and done. No. But Job, with eyes of faith, says, this is just because it's you. I'll, t- I'll put it this way. If it hasn't been clear enough, let me try to make it even clearer. I get confused by people who get mad at God because God didn't do what they like. Or I, I get it emotionally. I get it emotionally. Logically, I don't get it. He, God allowed this into my life. I asked him to take it away. He didn't. He allowed the sickness. He allowed the disaster. He allowed the wreck. He allowed the death. He allowed whatever. And I'm going to be mad at him because he, he could have changed it and he didn't. Here's what's happening, okay? If God has a power that is greater than yours so that he can fix whatever is ailing you, then he has to, with that, also have a wisdom that is far greater than yours that he and he alone will know if he should fix or not fix what's ailing you. The two go together. You cannot say, God, I believe you're God. I believe you have power, and I believe that you could have fixed whatever it was. You have a power that's far greater than mine and far more infinite than me, and you're, you're, you're so powerful and so big that you could have done it, but I'm mad at you because you didn't. You have to, with the power, also see the wisdom and say, if he has that much power, it would only logically make sense that he has that much wisdom that doesn't answer to yours that is far beyond yours, and it may not make sense to you, but it doesn't have to make sense to you. And I know that's tough love. I know that's something that you don't want to hear, nor do I, but it's the truth. He doesn't owe you explanations. He may give you some. He may give you reasons, but he may not. It may be that the only reason he's doing it is to show you that the only reason you love him is because of what he provides. And when he ceases to be a cosmic vending machine that gives you what you want, I press the button, it's at a reasonable price, and it's exactly what I need, and it comes out, and that stops, and I say I'm done with it. Maybe he's trying to show you that that's your heart. Maybe he's trying to show you that you're treating him how you would never allow another human to treat you. That you don't love him and trust him because of who he is. It's strictly because of what he does. And I'm grateful for what God does. He's done so much in my life that, he, that could never be outweighed. The salvation that he's given, the life that he's given, the family that he gave me. The, I could go on and on and on circumstantially. But that's not, that's not the sum total of why we worship God and why we trust God. That's a side issue. The reason we worship and we praise and we trust and we allow him to flip over our tables is just because he's God and he has the authority. He gets to. And if you say, no, you can't, then I dare say you'll find yourself what we'll look at next week, the end of John chapter number two, where it says that people believed, but Jesus didn't believe their belief. People believed and Jesus said, no, you don't. We got faith. I don't believe you. And you'll find yourself in a spot where you'll profess and you'll say that I love and I trust and God is God and But it's not in reality until he flips your tables and you say, you know what? You get to. You get to. These people never got a great reason. Even his followers took them years to figure it out. They're befuddled the whole time. Why did he do that? Why did he say that? I don't get it. And eventually they find out. And you may too, with whatever circumstance you don't like in your life, but you may not. So the moral of the story is this. Don't seek to place God and place God's power on your timetable. Don't seek to domesticate him. His power is not on demand to you. This is Jesus saying, I filled your table and I can turn your table over. I do both. Now, I don't know. I'll land the plane, okay? I don't know 
what your view of God in your relationship with Jesus needs from this chapter. Maybe you need it last week more. Maybe you need this week more. I don't know. Perhaps it's last week and you needed to know that Jesus is the Lord of the feast, that Jesus brings festival joy, that he is a bridegroom and you're his bride, meaning he set his affection upon you and he loves you and he wants to care for you and he doesn't want to abuse you or treat you maliciously and he's not some cosmic killjoy who just wants to rob you of all the good things in life and just make you a little robot who does and says exactly what he wants. It's, maybe you need that Jesus and you need to know that he, he loves you and his heart for you. Perhaps you need this Jesus, the Lord of the whip, who has the authority to fill your table but overturn your table, who has, who has not just the ability but the right to do what he wants without an explanation to you and not answer to your wisdom and your authority. Do you see someone as God, as someone who has to check in with you before he acts? Have you attempted to tame him? Because Jesus is both of these. He's all of John 2. He's the Lord of the feast and the Lord of the whips both. And if you don't have both, there will come a time where your Christianity will crumble from underneath of you because you don't get who he is and you haven't trusted him properly.